Good morning. So um, before we get started, um, I want to let you know that you're welcome to have your devices out. Just please silence your phone so that we don't have those interruptions. But we want you to, to tweet and Facebook about these things. So you're welcome to have those um, out. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mohammed Rahman. Uh, Dr. Rahman is an associate professor of management at the Cranach School of Management here at Purdue. Um, his research focuses on digital business, retail and web analytics, consumer behavior, and decision making. And today he will present a talk titled, Our New Realities, Omnichannel Shopping and the Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rahman. Well, thank you. <coughs> uh, good morning. Uh, Thanks for coming to this presentation. Uh, it's really exciting to see all of you interested in learning about how technology is changing our shopping behavior. Um, I'm sure many of you have been experiencing and are taking advantages of uh, different technology-led shopping changes and innovations. Um, as technology is becoming omnipresent and you know more and more, more and more accessible, uh, there is this widely held belief that you know uh, physical stores are becoming irrelevant. The whole idea is, you know, like uh, as we are using internet, smartphones, and different technologies, uh, physical stores do not account for that significant amount of sales anymore. Rather, e-commerce probably accounts for more sales. That's sort of the widely held belief. So I'd like to start there. Um, if we look at, oops, let's see. If we look at these charts. Uh, in terms of the number of traffic uh, to malls in the busiest season of the year, in November and December, we see that between 2010 and 2013, the numbers have gone down significantly, almost half of what it used to be in 2010. Now, when you look at sort of the numbers for the new retail space being added uh, annually for physical retailing, again, what we notice is that it's about 15% of what it used to be in 2000. So certainly we see from these numbers that, okay, there is some indication that perhaps, you know, physical stores are not visited as frequently, right? Um, but I don't think these are good enough to conclude that they're not as important anymore. So let's look at some more facts and more numbers. Um, so if we look at total retail sales in the last quarter, which is the most recent quarter that's available in the, in the U.S. economy, the total sales was about $1.1 trillion. Someone said, wow. Yeah, that's just one quarter. Uh, so in the US. So now out of that, how much do you think was sort of part of, uh, like was accounted by the e-commerce? I mean, just think, I mean, so what is it significant? So if you look at the e-commerce sales in this last quarter, it was, ta-da. 7.2%. It's well below a double digit number. So it's still e-commerce is a very small percentage of total sales. So what we know is physical stores are still generating bulk of the sales. Now if you look at the growth for overall retail sales year to year, there was about 1.1 uh, about 1% growth on a year to year basis. Now for e-commerce the growth was about 14%. Now, how do we reconcile this fact? We saw the dwindling numbers for people going to malls or physical stores. Certainly, we are not seeing a lot of physical space being added in terms of physical retailing. But then, physical stores are accounting for bulk of the sales even today. So one possible explanation that may come to your mind is, well, maybe overall retail sales is going down itself. If people are not going to stores and stores are accounting for most sales, that's a plausible explanation. So let's look at overall sales for last 14, 15 years. Here is the uh, graph for overall sales, yearly sales for last 14 years. So between 2000 and 2014, we said, you know, it's, it's, it's been steady, you know, uh, and for the most part, it was, it's going growing up. Uh, so, you know, except for the recession time, 2008, 2009, there was a little bit of bleep, but the point is, it's been going up, it's, it's increasing. So it's not going down, especially between 2010 and 13, 14. So 
So now how do we reconcile these facts? So this is where I would like to actually defer to the wisdom of Einstein. So there are things that need to be counted that we're not being able to measure. So there are sources that are driving cells in physical stores and at the same time actually reducing the number of people visiting stores, but we're not able to measure them. And that's because you know there we are in the middle of technological revolutions. We are not precise yet in terms of measuring everything yet. But of course, in over time we probably would be better at it, but at this point we're not able to sort of account for everything and credit them for the numbers that I've shown you so far. But certainly we can talk about these new realities and many of us are actually experiencing them regularly. So if you think about our new realities, 70% of the shoppers actually go online before they go to the store. They do all their research online before they go to the store. Now, if you think about shopping process, a lot of people would go and do a lot of knowledge building sessions. So you know, you'd go to the store, look at a set of products, go back, look at a set of products, sort of you know, find your product after a few trips. But now, most people are doing those research, those knowledge building sessions, and coming up with their set online. So they're you know, coming up with this because it's very convenient. Your search cost is low. You don't have to drive to the mall or the, to the store. Um, you are able to do it at any time. And for the most part, in most places, if you have your smartphone, you can do it anywhere, or your iPads or your tablets. So, so that re reduces the traffic to the mall. And then while in the store, 36% of the consumers actually use their smartphone to do more research, to find more, to find more information. So again, that reduces the need to go to different stores because you know often in the past people would actually go to a store and wonder about okay, is it available in another store, and sort of go to that store and say okay, what's the price there? Is it available? How does it look? But now you can stand in one store and sort of see okay, is it available somewhere out there, uh, and how does it look? What's the price and things like that. Um, so overall, that reduces the need for visiting a store and frequenting different stores. And your smartphone becomes a very powerful device in helping you in this whole shopping experience. And not surprisingly, retailers are paying attention. So if you look at a big box retailer like Walmart, and they're promising that they're going to you know, give you a very good shopping experience through your smartphone. You know they're paying attention. Uh, and you can actually do a lot of things with the Walmart app, including you know, finding ads, coupons, uh, you know, store maps, things like that. Um, and you know, there are reasons why this smartphone is very important. So before we you know, uh, get into more details, let me ask you a question. Let's step back. Take a moment and think about who knows that you came to listen to this talk. So maybe you're thinking, well, your family members, so your boyfriend, girlfriends, spouses, parents, friends, colleagues, or maybe no one. But if you're carrying a smartphone, it has the geolocation service probably on, and it actually knows where you are. And if you use something like Google Now or you know even iPhone uh, assistant services, so if you if you, you know include like if you're putting schedules on your calendar, you will get a notification. Let's say you know 15 minutes before the event that hey, you have to drive 15 minutes. Here's the weather. Here's the traffic. You know like uh, if you go to work every day at 9 a.m., you don't have to tell Google Now that you go to work at 9 a.m. And you don't have to tell where you work, actually. You go to the office every day. You spend about 8 to 10 hours. After a few days, it figures out that you work at Trainer. You know, that's the case for me, right? It figures out that you work at Trainer. And then it starts to give you notification that, look, here's the traffic. Here's the weather. Do you work? So this device is very intelligent. And it's able to collect data so precisely that it can deliver values for you. And not surprisingly, retailers are paying attention. And there is another fact. Most of us are inseparable from our smartphones. For most people, it's within arm's reach. 
So there are really good reasons to take advantage of this device from the retailer's perspective and also from shoppers as you become more and more sort of you know experienced with taking that advantage of these devices you 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 know you, you take more advantage of those so just look at some examples so if you look at the app from Walgreens you know you can get the store map and if you are looking for a particular category it actually tells you where this category is you're in the store it actually you know it tells you okay you can find this there if you're in Home Depot um, and if you're someone like me who gets lost in Home Depot all the time and needs a lot of help, so you know you can actually look at the product online on their app, and then ask for where this product is, and then it'll show you the map in the store where this is with the aisle number. Now there are startups, and in fact I'm working with one startup that's working on a technology where you just tell the app that okay you want this nail or screw. And it'll take you to that product. Because for me, still when I go to the aisle, I'm still lost because there are so many things. Uh, or if you, you know, scan an image of a part, it'll actually take you to that part. So the whole point is, this is a great sort of assistant in helping us shop, right? Uh, if you have a picture of your home and you're looking for a door that you want to try and see you know, how this is going to look on your house, you can do that. You can sort of see, okay, how this is going to look, and that's on, um, you know, Home Depot app. The other thing is, a lot of people love this. As you're walking around, you're looking at a pair of shoes, blurry probably, um, you know, it pops a coupon for you, 50% off. But the reality is, if you get this coupon, you may not be getting this 50% off. You may be paying 70% off or the full price. So. Your phone is a sort of a communication device with this product and it gives you sort of uh, personalized coupons and information and things like that. And there are values in that. So you know, like there is a marketing study that looked at people's grocery shopping patterns. So on average, consumers walk around 1,400 feet in a grocery trip. If you can make them walk another 55 feet, they'll spend a dollar more in unplanned spending. So meaning, you have your grocery list, you'll deviate from the, that list and spend a dollar more if they can make you walk 55 feet. So in a field experiment, these uh, researchers, what they've done is the coupon people. Now, once people receive their coupons, if you sent them a coupon for a product where they had to actually walk you know, far away from their planned path, they ended up spending about $21 in unplanned spending. Even when the coupons were given for uh, products where it was close to the shopping path, they spent about $14, $14 more in unplanned spending. You know, for a grocery trip, that's pretty significant. Right? So definitely, the behavior can be changed with uh, you know, communicating with these devices. Now, so far, we've been looking at the power of smartphone. It doesn't have to be the case that they're just uh, talking to you or recognizing you, who you are and giving you offers based on smartphone. It could be also based on facial recognition. So if you walk in the store, they recognize who you are and deliver things. So uh, some of you may have seen Minority Report that came out in 2002. Um, it's a science fiction that talks about how uh, retina retin recognition would allow retailers to actually show you personalized ads in 2054. So Steven Spielberg was thinking that in 2054 we'll all be recognized through our retinas and then see ads in the store. So here's a clip uh, just to remind you. Oops, do we have sound here?
So here, uh, Tom Cruise was playing as uh, John Anerton, right? And then he was being recognized through his retinas. Um, and it was all in 2054, and as you saw, to be not recognized anymore as who he was, John Anerton, he actually got transplanted uh, and became Mr. Ikumaro. Um, now, the question is, do we have to wait until 2054 to experience all of this? Fortunately, in 2006, Microsoft got this patent where they can use online information collected online about consumers and sort of use that information to target you in stores and show ads to you. Now, um, and that includes facial recognition. So they can use your images that are available out there online and then deliver things personally to you. And then, you know, it's very difficult to transplant your whole face. Now, to do this, what do they need to know? What do they need to know in terms of the retailers? Well, if you're, if you're thinking about a retailer being effective in sort of you know, doing facial recognition and delivering things to you personally, um, in terms of the population of the US, they need to know about 320 million faces. If they're thinking about China, that's about 1.2 billion people. Oh, sorry, India. If they're thinking about China, it's about 1.36 billion people. And I think, you know, we think we can stop here. But there is a place where there are about 1.5 billion people, and almost all these people have their faces available at this place, which is Facebook. So if Facebook were a country, it would have been the most populated. And not only that, more than 99% of the people have their images on Facebook. And Facebook's facial recognition technology, deep face, by many accounts is actually about 97% correct in recognizing faces, even from the sides. In comparison, FBI's technology is correct only 85% of the time. So you know the technology is out there where it's possible to recognize you in the store through these technologies. Now, the question is, what's in it for me? I mean, what's in it for you as a consumer? I mean, you seem all really invading your privacy, right? Certainly they are, to some extent. But then, what are the consumers getting, and why are we able to do all of this? So if you think about it, the first thing is the concierge service that's available through developments of technologies. Most of us, as general people, can't afford a body man or a omen. Only the politicians, the rich folks, celebrities, they actually have a body man or a body woman who does all the concierge services for them. But then with these technologies, like a smartphone, or when you're on a website, or you're in the store, it can actually provide you concierge services, and it's pretty accessible and pretty affordable. After you all carry a smartphone, we're all going to the store, right? We're all using the internet. So what happens there? Well, it can give you personalized product experiences. Sort of, you know, things are sort of personalized for you. You can get personalized coupons, as I showed you, right? And you may have already experienced things. You're getting coupons. And you know, often you compare your coupons with others, family members. It's not the same. And then many of us are actually using different devices to shop. So you know, if you're in a store, um, you're looking at some product and you don't have the size for this pair of shoes, you can just pull up your smartphone, go to the website of the retailer, get the size you want. Or vice versa, if you're trying for, you're looking for a product, you don't like the product assortment in the store, you can stand in the store, pick up their iPad or you know, your phone, order from there online and they'll actually ship it to your home. So this whole shopping experience becomes pretty seamless. There is no boundary across different channels anymore. We're all sort of able to do things uh, across different channels. And also, through this concierge service and active role from the retailers, they can reduce you know, unsatisfactory experiences. So you're less frustrated. You're sort of less unhappy. Uh, and you know, more by, by far, most consumers are happier with getting all this personalized stuff because it, it helps them to uh, shop and they enjoy shopping. The other thing is honesty is being enforced. So if you think about it, 
You don't have to take the words of the retailer anymore or the salesperson in the store. You can check reviews. You can check blogs. You can actually uh, ask your friends on the fly what they think about this product. You can you know, send notification to your Facebook friends and say, okay, vote on this. Should I buy this thing? Right? Um, you know, the ski hills are well known for uh, exaggerating their snow level, how much snow they have on the hill. When people now, with, when skiers are going up the hill with an iPhone and then actually providing the exact information, how much snow is there, it's very difficult to cheat. So honesty is actually being enforced with all this information out there. So now let's look at some of the concierge services that we often uh, sort of experience and that are being sort of enabled with the technological advancements. So first of all, when you look at online, when you go to a retail website page, you actually get a personalized landing page. The whole idea is you go to the website, the page you look at is actually often personalized for you. So what, what you're seeing, I won't be probably seeing the same thing. And it's done based on what you have done in terms of buying from this website you're, you're on, on your historical purchases, what you're doing at this point, so what sort of things you're looking at at the point, and then based on that, they actually give you contents that are sort of suitable for you. They may be also doing personalized pricing. So the prices you see may not be the same as what your friend sees or you know, if you log in from a different, completely different computer that doesn't recognize you, that price may not be the same. Um, and you can really experiment that as we're getting into the busiest shopping season. And then of course, recommendations are dynamic and they're sort of based on who you are and what you're doing at that point. So here's an example. Uh, this is Amazon's landing page. Uh, you see a bunch of extension cards and things uh, around that. Uh, it's my landing page. And the reason is I recently bought an extension card from Amazon. And they're showing me all these recommendations based on what I've done. Uh, and a bug zapper, so you can probably see what they're trying to sell me. But then, when you go on Amazon website right now, you're not going to see this. Because that's not probably what you bought, and that's not your history. So that's the personalized landing page that you get, and this is a great concierge service because it sort of takes into consideration who you are. Now, the similar thing is possible in offline stores. So you know, the same thing, like they can use your purchase, purchase history, your historical activities, uh, what you're doing at this point, and deliver uh, personalized content on your apps, if you're in the store with your phone, or they can actually alert a sales associate to come and talk to you and give a set of product recommendation based on who you are. Or if you're using their phone, uh, sorry, uh, the tablet that's available. Now the key here is that you need a communication channel where you are having a private communication with the retailer. So it could be your smartphone, um, could be your wearable, could be the tablet, because you know, in the online case, by structure, we are in a private communication channel. Uh, in the store, you know, what you see on your phone, as I said, it may not be the same as what someone else is seeing, and that's where you need the private communication channel. Uh, generally, you won't expect that they're gonna change the price tag while you're standing and someone else is standing and two different price tags. That's not gonna work, right? I mean, so that's where they need some way of communicating with you. Now what's the key in delivering all of these things? The key is digital traces. You need to have digital traces to be able to actually deliver these sort of superior experiences. Um, Hyper-connected consumers so consumers of today have so many devices, wearables, phones, uh, tablets. They're leaving digital traces everywhere. And these traces can be collected and processed to come up with a profile for consumers and actually deliver things to consumers. Um, your smartphones and wearables, as I you know, alluded earlier, can provide exact geolocation of where you are. That's a great thing. It not only tells you where you are, at what time you are, and how you're moving. A retailer can take heat maps of the store and sort of see how the crowds are moving in the store every five minutes and get a sense of which products are being 
uh, more visited and which products are not being more visited. So these technologies are out there to be able to you know, track these digital traces. And the other big advancement is that we have technologies that can capture all this data and analyze the data. Think about how much data is being generated every second. You, you need to be able to capture this stuff and then analyze it to be able to deliver the experience. So certainly those things exist. So let me just you know, walk you through some examples of how sort of uh, digital traces help in delivering a superior experience and what we can infer from digital traces. Uh, this is some of the research we have done where we looked at clickstream data, which is you know, the earlier starting, the beginning of collecting digital traces. So clickstream is basically when you're on a website, when you make a click, every click is recorded in a log. So if you think that nobody's watching you, think twice. Every click is actually recorded in the log. And then you can analyze this log and see how consumers have sort of traversed through the website and what they've done in terms of using different technologies, different features, and, and also analyze and what they've bought. So basically, it allows a retailer to understand the shopping path of a consumer and what sort of technologies they're taking advantage of and ultimately how that's affecting sales and returns. Um, oops. Sorry. So here, you can combine the clickstream data with the transaction data that's out there with the retailer and sort of see how different things are affecting sales, return, so those sort of consumer behaviors. So let's look at some of the shopping technologies that are out there that you may often use. So in terms of navigational technologies, there is search. You can search. So typically you can say, okay, what? I want this product. If you know the exact SKU of the product, it'll take you to that product. If you're looking for, you can do generic searches like shirts or pants. It will give you a set of products like shirts or pants, and then you can pick from there. Uh, then there is recommendation system. So when you're looking at a product, it suggests you other products that you may be interested in, or it says you know, other people have bought. So you know, uh, you, it, you know, you're looking at this product, these are the other related products it's suggesting. So it actually offers you, makes you aware of other products that are related and that you may be interested in. When you look at pro, uh, product oriented technologies, so like things like zooming, which allows you to get more facts. So you can actually zoom in and see, okay, how the fabrics are, how the different materials are. So you can get more facts from uh, using these technologies. Or you can look at alternative photos where you know it shows you a model you know, wearing this product from different angles. So it gives an idea of how you may look like in this product. If you think of a piece of furniture, they often appoint it in a very nice environment and then you know, takes picture from different angles and it gives you a sense of how this furniture or this carpet is gonna look like in your house. And these are technologies people are really using all the time. Now let's analyze these technologies and see what can be done in terms of generating insights for a better concierge. And then there is also color swatch. Uh, so when we analyze search, people generally do two types of searches. Directed search or non-directed search. So directed search is when you know exactly what you're looking for. So it's a product title you know or the SKU you know, you're just looking for that product and the search engine takes you to that product. Uh, non directed search is cases where you don't know what you want. You're doing generic searches like pants, shirts, uh, you know, things like that, books, fictions. You're basically doing a generic search. You don't have the exact product in mind. You probably just know a category. Uh, so it gives you a bunch of product in return uh, in terms of results, and then you can pick something from there. Now, what we, have, we know from our study is that when people do directed searches, it increases sales of promoted products. Now, if you think about why, if you know exactly a product, you must have seen it somewhere. And generally, these are through promotions. You've seen it in some promotions, and that's why you're interested in this product, so you're looking for it. Now, when we look at the impact of non-directed search, it doesn't really have any significant impact on sales. The reason is, 
whenever people do non-regression searches, most search engines will actually generate lots of results and it's information overload. People don't know what they're doing. It kind of lost me to your product. So what's the insight for a concierge model? Well, make the search more convenient and most, more importantly, don't let them lost in the sea of product. Don't let consumers lost in the sea of product. So as a consumer, you're going to enjoy a better, more, more better guided search. So you know, if you're looking for pants, it will guide you through the search process rather than you know, giving you a bunch of sort of results. Maybe it will ask you, okay, do you want slacks, do you want jeans, do you want formal pants? Sort of walk you through the search process so it's more guided. Now when we look at recommendation systems, uh, it improves sales for both promoted products and non-promoted products. But it skews the sales toward non-promoted products. Now why is that? Well, recommendation system, it shows you a bunch of products, recommendations like five or seven, based on what you're looking at. That includes products that are promoted, that you may have seen before, but includes products that you are not aware of. And when you see things that you're not aware of, it seems like consumers actually follow them and then ultimately consider them and buy them. Um, and we know by starting with our partner retailer, it increases sales significantly, fi over 5.5%. So not surprisingly, you see recommendations on your apps, on your website, pretty much on every retail website. Okay, let's now look at product-oriented technologies. Uh, when you look at product-oriented technologies, Zoom, um, again, as I said earlier, it allows you to actually get more facts. So you can inspect more, you can get factual information. Uh, so when you look at alternative photos, on the other hand, it allows you to get an impression of what you might look like. So it's, an, sort of, it's a perception that you're getting because you're looking at a model from different angles or you're looking at a piece of furniture in a nice environment from different angles. Now, what is the result? Well, first of all, these technologies are out there not to just increase sales, but also to reduce return. Because return is very expensive. It costs the US economy more than $100 billion a year. So they are giving you this technology so that you don't return. What we know is when people use Zoom, the return rate actually goes down. Now why? Well, return is basically a result of satisfaction. When you buy a product, you have some pre-purchase expectation. You're expecting something from this product. And when you get the product, if that matches, you're happy, you don't return. But then, so if you look at Zoom, it gives you more and more factual information, so your expectation is actually more realistic, and what you get matches, so you're happy. Return doesn't go up, it goes down. Now when we look at alternative photos, on the other hand, it increases returns. Not only that, while it increases sales, the net sales, so sales minus return can still be negative. In fact, for the retailer we worked with, it was negative. So in usage of alternative photo was hurting in terms of the net. Now what's going on? Well, it's the impression-based information. So again, think about the fact that you're looking at a model from different angles and thinking like you're gonna look as beautiful as this model. And once you get the product, you have an inflated expectation, Unfortunately, you don't necessarily look as beautiful as this model, you're unhappy. Or if you think about a piece of furniture, same thing, right? It's a nicely appointed piece of furniture or a carpet. It looks very nice in that professionally done picture from different angles. My house is not as nicely appointed, right? So then that, that sort of uh, equilibrium gets sort of, you know, th there's that disequilibrium and people are unhappy and then people sort of return the product. So what's the implication for concierge model? Well, there is probably value in actively sort of nudging and intervening the consumers while they're looking at products that they might return. So if you're shopping online and you're looking at a product, you know, um, maybe they should help you sort of form a more realistic expectation. And you know, I, there are retailers who are doing that. So Walmart, Amazon, Petco, they actually allow regular consumers and I encourage regular consumers to upload photos and videos of using a product. So you buy the product, they say, you know what, upload photos of you, what's going on? Well, they're trying to make sure others come and see regular people using this product, so then you 
expectations are not inflated. Similarly, you know, they can probably you know, send a associate, send, send an associate. If they know that, okay, you, have, you are likely to return this product, they can send an associate and say, look, may, you may want to try this product before you buy it. Or through your app, they can send a notification and suggest that, well, maybe try this. If the product is not available in the store, the one that you're looking online while you're standing in the store, they can say, okay, what? You know what? We don't have this exact product in the store, but something related to this, related to this you may want to try that before you buy this. So this active sort of uh, helping and intervening can help consumers be happier. All right, so let's go through the gist of uh, designing a better concierge. Uh, so what we know is in an omni-channel shopping world, you know, where we don't really have to worry about different channel barriers, insights obtained from online can be used actually to deliver uh, uh, value in offline stores. So you know, like if you're standing in a local store, they can use those insights that we collected online to better your experience. You know, again, it could be through the digital kiosk, it could be through your smartphone, it could be through uh, some sort of uh, sales associate that's actually talking to you. But the point is, it is possible. And then, as we get more, get more and more digital traces from the local stores, because you know stores are becoming digitized, you're using your apps in local stores, so there will be a lot more traces generated locally. Those can be collected and be used even to improve your shopping online. Or those things can be combined, so because you know, a lot of people are doing their knowledge building online. If you combine that, with what they're doing in store, that's a very rich picture of consumers. And then sort of improve the concierge that is at your service. And then there is a lot of crowdsource information. You know, there are lots of reviews, there are lots of uh, blogs, uh, people all around are talking about different products, different features they want. Uh, many people don't go to a restaurant without checking Yelp, right? So now, what we know is that um, it, this information can be used for developing a better product. This information can be uh, used to come up with different technologies and features to help consumers. And then, you know, as the, this digitization continues, we're not done. I mean, we're in the middle of this whole revolution that's going on, right? And more and more technologies are coming up. So as stores become more and more digitized, there will be a lot more traces that are being generated, and then uh, the experiences would actually improve. And you know, I'll show you. I will show you a clip uh, right after this, where your smartphone can be the complete personal assistant, where you don't have to talk to a human being while in the store. You can complete all your shopping just through a smartphone. Apple actually pioneered this model. If you have ever been to an Apple store, you don't have to talk to any human being. You can go in, you can check all the products. If you want to talk to an associate, you call them and you talk to them. They don't come and bug you. So you are looking at the product, you can look at these products, you can actually buy them and leave the store without even talking to anyone. And here is what is actually uh, being enabled with your smartphone now. products, no mannequins and merchandise. This is it. And here, customers control the goods with their phones. Using a special pointer app, you scan the product code. The system asks your size, assigns you a dressing room, and within 30 seconds, your choices appear. The store was designed with male shoppers in mind. It just was easy, and I kept buying it. And you would have done that before. Yeah. Your no. Even those that think they are hard to fit. When I got these, um, I'm built kind of differently, so they didn't. Have, they had my size, but they. What does that mean? Differently than what? I got a little jump. 
<laughs> but the concept has women coming in too. Once people see what it is, this store will appeal to any person who wears clothes. For mother and hairdresser Ivory Anderson, the appeal is not just what she finds in the store, but also what she doesn't. Crazy shopkeepers <laughs> trying to sell you things. Right. right. Or a 17-year-old with their first job who is a size zero who doesn't understand. <laughs> you know? In fact, in the privacy of your dressing room, you can try on as much as you'd like. Okay. I can't be sure, but I might need a belt. Need a different size? Use your phone to order more and drop any unwanted items down the return chute. The system updates on your phone. So whereas in most stores they keep all the inventory out in the store where you can see it, here, everything is hidden behind this wall. Thousands of jeans packed into a micro warehouse, along with a super secret delivery system that we're not even allowed to see. It is kind of our secret sauce. Sure, Bora says that top secret, super fast system is what helps her to keep costs down and customers happy. A few large retailers are now interested in buying it. So, you know, in fact, uh, just, you know, I know Macy's, is actually trialing a system like this. They have uh, trial rooms where they have iPads, um, and you can go and order as many products as you want through that iPad and try them. So you know they have uh, this. They're actually testing it for lingeries, and uh, you can try as many as you want before you buy them. But step back and think about how much digital traces we have from this system. You're ordering things. They're coming, you're returning, everything is recorded, right? So with all this digitization, we'll know exact shopping path of people, what they're doing, how many pairs you have to try before you buy. And if you buy, you know, if you tried 100 pairs and you bought something and you returned, that would be also recorded, right? Everything is traceable. So the digital traces that are going to come in as we go through more and more digital experiences, it's going to be enormous. And as I mentioned earlier, this is also being combined with the whole social media experience. People are actually sharing things. You know, you can actually send things while you're standing at the trial room and ask your friends, hey, should I buy this? You can take a selfie and share it. And people can vote and you decide. So here are my closing thoughts. Uh, Certainly our superior shopping experience and the convenience that we're getting in this concierge model is highly dependent, critically dependent on the digital traces that are being left. Whether it's online, offline, certainly we have been doing that online for a long, long time. Uh, now we're doing that offline pretty frequently. Um, and I don't think it's an overstatement to say that retailers often know more about you than you know about yourself. Just think about how many times you have remembered how many pairs of pants you've tried before buying something. You know, so like they actually would have all these records. Um, some of the high-end trial rooms, they now actually allow you to order a glass of sparkling water while you're trying. You can probably analyze and see if that makes a difference what you buy. You know, having a glass of sparkling water or a glass of wine, does that make a difference while you're trialing products? Right? You don't keep track of what you're doing. And based on your shopping habit, it's possible to sort of predict what you're going to do next. Most of us don't know that about ourselves. Because we don't have that much rich information about ourselves. And also, we don't have the processing power, and we don't necessarily process it. And here is the thought I want you to leave with. Um, so certainly, there is a lot of convenience that's being generated. The question that I guess you know we need to ponder on is should convenience and value trump privacy concerns? There is a lot of privacy invasion. There's no doubt about that around all this data collection. But then should that should the value and the experience trump all that experience, uh, all that cons all those concerns? Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? We have five ten minutes for questions. Yeah. Yes. Here's the size I want and everything. And, and what, when does that come to that point where it says, you don't wear that size? <laughs> you know, could you imagine? 
certainly. I'm going to send you this set because they know that about you from your past experiences. Absolutely. Um, and then my other thought is I've already seen this, um, been in the same shopping environment with somebody, and they buy something that I was like, oh, I would have bought that, but it never even became available to me because based on my preferences, it never popped up. So where does some of that data actually hurt them because they're not showing me everything because they're just showing me what they think I want. Great question. So you know that's where it's a continuous process, right? It's a continuous improvement process. So what you're talking about is a lot of the rec re these recommendation systems are actually based on collaborative filtering. So what sort of people have done and what you've done, and you know th the sophistications are different depending on the system. Um, Certainly we're not, we don't have this whole digital trace from physical stores, right? So what you're talking about is, you know, you're walking and you see somebody shopping cart and you sort of like that and then you want to see that product, right? So as of now, we don't have a very good sense of that. But then think about the advancements that I showed you, right? So when you're walking, um, you looked at something that's possible to capture through cameras and facial recognition. If you go back to that product that's available, that's also possible to capture that you have looked at that product. So I think we'll be there, but it's a matter of time. So in fact, uh, they just made uh, IBM's Watson available for uh, data analytics uh, widely for different startups. And part of their goal for Watson is actually to be able to do source set processing that we can't do with regular sort of machine learning at this moment. Yes. the only trade-off. So uh, the, the retailers are measuring the, uh, our emotions, what we want, but they don't measure what we need. And so there's a lot of times there's not a, much of an intersection between what we want and what we need. So if I have a lot of credit card debt, or if I have some health condition that means that I shouldn't be eating this thing or drinking this thing, uh, the retailers don't know that, and they many times pull us away from our own welfare. Do you have any comments on that? It's a great question. You know, so I think um, I mean, let me let me take it in two parts. So one part of this is basically, if you think about retailers as profit maximizing agents, right? Uh, and if you think about that, then they're certainly more interested in their profit margin than welfare of people. And other thing is they don't necessarily have all this information about, even if they have the intention, as you said, they don't have those information at this moment about your health conditions, your uh, debt and all that. But I think, think about the advancements with Google, Play, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, and also I think Samsung got this, Samsung Pay. What will happen is you will have all this information uh, to your phone where you're paying. And with all the wearables that are actually tracking your health conditions, because a big push toward wearable is actually finally going to be your health tracking. That's what I believe, your health record. So once you combine that, they will also know things about you in terms of your health. That would be Google. It may not be an individual sort of retailer. And that's where these data brokers are becoming more and more profitable. And you know, I say data is actually better than real estate. Real estate, we can rent it, and then we can re-rent it and re-rent it. But the trick is we can rent an apartment to one person at once. Data, we can rent it to a bunch of people at once. And that's what's going to happen to some of these companies like Google and others who are collecting. You know, they're investing tremendously in these technologies to collect all this information, to actually have a better sense of who you are, and holistically. Depending on depending on their intent, I, I totally agree on that. Depending on the, their intent, yes. So um, last year I worked for the uh, luxury hotel World of Astoria, and they are known for their on, not online but real concierge experiences that is called the World of Service, the World of Experience actually, and they had study to show that uh, luxury customers who actually prefer the luxury experiences more than some virtual reality help. Do you think that is going to be, the f do you think in the future that consumers going to change their preferences from real people to 
um, software like you were describing? Uh, it's a good question. It's hard for me to predict what consumers are going to do. But I think certainly we're getting more and more adopted to what we see every day. Now, I think, so if you, so what I'm going to say is if you think about the concierge service, you're absolutely right. So far, it's been for the elites, for the privileged class, right? So if you are walking into a expensive uh, store like, I don't know, Louis Vuitton, for lack of example, somebody will open your door and give you a glass of water and things like that. And I guess if you're wearing a suit, then maybe they'll, they'd be nice to you. And then if, you, if I'm wearing my regular stuff that I wear, they're probably not going to open the door for me, right? Um, I think that would be the difference. So you know, if you think about it, that's sort of for a certain class. But then with all these advancements we're having, with your personal assistant being a smartphone, it's not possible to give similar experience to regular folks without really incurring that cost. And you know, retail, certainly those, ret those retailers are incurring a lot of cost by having this service, right? And that's why they're just targeting that small segment. But what I'm saying is, with the advancements we're having, it will be available for the wider audience. And you know, who knows? Maybe it, I mean, what will happen? Certainly, happen is that those human beings that are greeting local people right now, local I mean, customers, rich customers right now, they're going to be equipped with data. So they will certainly be better at delivering their service with the help of technology. Whether or not it will replace the humans, I'm not sure. Anyone else here? Yeah. Oh, the mic is there. I, I was um, thinking about, uh, I recently traveled in Europe and every, all the credit cards are um, encrypted with RFID chip. And I was wondering how um, facial recognition, did it like trump the RFID chip? Why don't we have RFID chips here in the U.S.? Is it because the technology of facial rec recognition is going to be so much more beneficial? So you're thinking about RFID uh, on a credit card, right? Right. It's like a location. Yeah, it's a location thing. So, um, so right now, um, most U.S. credit card companies are actually changing their credit cards with chips. So we will see chips now. They'll have digital chips. Um, I think by the end of October or something, they have to issue you a card with the chip. Otherwise, the bank is responsible if there is some sort of fraud rather than the company like Visa or MasterCard. So we'll see those chips coming up. Um, but think about you know, chips. It, it is still able to sort of recognize you um, based on who you are. I agree, it's like RFID sort of thing. Uh, but then you have ways to actually hide that. You can put it in a sleeve or your, you know, your, uh, if your wallet has RFID sort of protection, then that signal is not going to go. It's very difficult to hide your face as you're walking. So, and that's that's really would be pretty uh, fundamental in terms of delivering value. So, uh, so we're talking a lot about how uh, how digital can ena can enable these shopping experiences, but as so many industries are moving more and more towards digital and uh, going away from brick and mortar, mm -hmm. uh, how do what opportunities do you see for for disruption that way in the shopping experience? And are there any industries in particular that might be more or less suited to uh, digital uh, cutting out a lot of the uh, possibly Big unnecessary? Brick and mortar. Yeah. So you know, um, as I have shown you some evidence, we are not saying that. I don't think we can conclude that brick and mortars are becoming irrelevant. Uh, what we're seeing is actually a hybrid of the two. So as we have more and more digital sort of capabilities, we're becoming more efficient, and the physical stores are there to actually complement that experience. Uh, and I think you see some evidence of that when you see like Amazon um, opening stores, you know, to deliver things for to deliver things for us, right? And they have locker rooms in different cities. So you know, physical is important. There, there are certain conveniences people want. But then, you know, certainly there will be industries that will be disrupted uh, with, with the sort of the technologies uh, in terms of uh, making physical stores 
not so important. So book is probably one, one of that, those categories, right? Um, unless, you know, you see innovations like that. So, you know, I mean, I often wonder um, why Barnes & Noble does not have a kiosk where it allows you to read a book digitally, right? So, I mean, so you don't have that experience online, so you get the whole ambience and all that thing. So, unless there is more innovation, some of these categories would be sort of gone, going away, like travel agencies, right? So, we don't... I mean, if you ask your parents or your grandparents, they've always used a travel agent before booking a flight. Have you ever used one? Any other questions? Uh, there is a famous website, uh, which its name is Tmall in China. Okay. And uh, every November 11th, there is a big event of sale uh, on in last year, the sales above uh, 50 billion and uh, RMB in China. And uh, um, in the sales, most of them are returned. And in your research, you said that Zoom can reduce the return. But uh, um, most of the goods in the Tmall, uh, uh, the customers can Zoom it. Uh, so what other method do you think will reduce the returns? Well, good question. So basically, you know, um, if you think about returns, aside from budget factors and other things, right? So like if people are returning because they can't pay the bill, that's a different story, right? But then if you're looking at, because of the uh, sort of information they're looking at, if they're collecting more and more facts, then that facts will make them very realistic about what they're expecting about this product. Now, in t on Tmall, they may have Zooming, uh, but are people using it? My understanding of that November 11 sales, I mean, I, am, I don't have a lot of good understanding about it, but my, my basic understanding is that people are going to flash sales, just grabbing whatever they can without even thinking twice and really collecting a lot of information and thinking about it, right? So it's sort of like um, they're saying, look, we have this limited quantity. It's a shopping frenzy, if you will, right? So you are not thinking and collecting a lot of information about that before you buy. And in those cases, certainly once you get the product, then you'll find things that you don't want, you're not happy with. Now what can retailers do? Well, they'll do certain things. So for example, they can, only, they can give you these examples. They can uh, allow other people to write a lot of blogs or ratings, which is out there, right? And they highlight these ratings. They can have advanced sort of technologies uh, where when you're buying, they can say, look, do you really want to buy this, right? Based on what you've done. Um, and then in terms of policies, there are retailers who actually charge you for returning things. And it could be for special days. So, you know, like if you, there are retailers where they don't charge you return fee for most of the year, but then when you buy things on, let's say, Thanksgiving Day or Black Friday online, those are not returnable, right? So I'm sure some of those techniques would come into play pretty soon. But I think by and large is because people are just thinking, uh, shopping without thinking. Any other question? I guess we can take maybe one more. None? All right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Raman.